Hello everyone, welcome to the seventh statistics lesson. In our last lesson, we looked at histograms, which is a way to graphically display quantitative data. In this lesson, we're gonna look at more ways to display quantitative data. Specifically, we're gonna look at stem and leaf plots, dot plots, and time series plots. So let's go ahead and get started with stem and leaf plots. In a stem and leaf plot, the rightmost digit is the leaf and the remaining digits form the stem. So what exactly does this mean? Well, let's look at an example to hopefully add some context and figure out what exactly we're talking about here. So here's an example data set. These are the heights in inches for 40 male college students. And remember, the rightmost digit of each data value is the leaf. So for this first data value here, one is the leaf. The remaining digits, which in this case are 64, that is the stem, right? In this case, five is the leaf, 65 is the stem. Nine is the leaf, 65 is the stem, right? Hopefully you are getting the idea. The rightmost digit is the leaf, the remaining digits form the stem. So our first step in constructing the stem and leaf plot is identify all the stems and write them out from smallest to largest in increasing order vertically like this. So we go from smallest at the top to largest at the bottom. And you can see that our biggest stem is 73. Luckily, this data set is already written for us nicely in increasing order. Now that what we do is we draw a vertical line to the right of all these stems, and then we start listing out the leaves for each stem. So our stem of 64 has one leaf, and that is one. So let's list that to the right of 64. Our stem of 65 has two leaves, five and nine. So let's list both of those out right here. Our stem of 66 has three, five, and eight. So let's list those out here. And hopefully you're getting the idea. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Next we have zero, two, five, five, six, eight, nine, nine. So I'm gonna write all of these out at once. And I'm going to continue this process and what we get is a complete stem and leaf plot for this data set. So one thing I want to point out is we always want to make sure that we go from smallest to largest vertically with our stems. And we want to do that as well with our leaves from left to right, smallest to largest, right? So I don't want to write this, for example, as 9.5. I want to make sure to write it as 5.9, which in this case is easy because, like I said, the data set is in order but that will not always be the case. Let's look at one more example. So before we look at the next example, let's go ahead and summarize the steps we took to graph that stem and leaf plot. So first we made a vertical list of all the stems in increasing order, and then we drew a vertical line to the right of that list. Then we went through the data set and for each value, we wrote its leaf next to its stem. If necessary, we need to arrange the leaves in increasing order, that was already done for us because again, the data set was given from smallest to largest, right? Which will not always be the case. So sometimes we'll have to go back and rearrange the leaves in increasing order. So here's our next example. Here's the one I want you to try on your own. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video and try this on your own. This is a data set containing the weights for 30 male college freshmen in pounds. See if you can construct a stem and leaf plot. Pull out a pencil and a paper. Try this. I'll give you a few seconds, then I'll show the solution on the screen. All right, so hopefully y'all were able to write this out. Here's the stem and leaf plot that I wrote. First, I noticed that the weights range from 124 to 195, so I listed out the stems 12 through 19 in increasing order. I drew my vertical line and then I started listing out the leaves attached to each stem. One thing I want to point out here is that first of all the data values are not in order so it takes a little bit more effort to make sure we put these in order. Additionally our leaves do not represent the tenth digit like they did in the last example. In this case our leaves represent the ones digit. So how we would read this going from this graph back to the data set is 124. 124, 124, 129, 133. Hopefully that's making sense, right? So if we just drew this graph and expected someone to be able to interpret the data set we're talking about, we would have to specify that and specify that the leaves represent the ones digit, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Let's look at one more example. So we can also use stem and leaf plots to make comparisons across two sets of quantitative data. And we can do this by constructing what we call a back-to-back -back 
stem and leaf plot. Okay, so we're going to do an example of that right here. We have two sets of data on exam scores, one from a psychology exam, one from a history exam. So let's see if we can construct what we call a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. So how we're going to start is we're going to label psychology and history, right? Back-to-back, -back, so one on each side. Now we're going to look at all of our stems. So the rightmost digits, in this case, are the ones digit. So our stems are going to be, like for this example, it's six, seven, five, etc. So it's looking like my smallest stem across both of the data sets is going to be three, and my largest is going to be nine. So let's go ahead and see if we can list those out. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we're going to start by just constructing a normal stem and leaf plot. So we're going to draw a vertical line off here to the right, and we're going to construct a stem and leaf plot for the history exam data set. So what are all the leaves attached to the stem of three? Well, in this case, there's none. So we jump to the stem four, which has a leaf of eight, right? Now let's look at the stem five. Well, let's see, we have a four. And then that's it. So we jump to six, which has a five, as well as a six, an eight, and a nine. And now we can continue to construct this stem and leaf plot until we're finished. And we can check at the end to make sure that each of these correspond to one of these data values. So hopefully you've already gotten practice with this, so I didn't go too fast here. Now what do we do? How do we do this back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot? Well, now we draw a vertical line on the left-hand side. And we construct a stem and leaf plot for the psychology exam data. So the only difference here, the only thing that's a little bit tricky, is that when we're writing these in increasing order, this time we go from right to left. So I'll show you what I mean. We first write our three to account for that 33 exam score. Then we can write our seven here. Now look, 56, 58, 59. So it's now increasing from right to left. So you can sort of think of it as it increases coming out from the stem, right? This stem sort of extends and the leaves increase, but in this case, this stem extends out this way. So the leaves increase from right to left. Continuing this, we can finish our back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot, accounting for all the data values in the psychology exam data set. And now what we have is called a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot, and we can use this to compare across the two exams. So we could see that the psychology exam students did worse on, it looks like. There's a lot more 30s, 40s, and 50s. There's more failing grades overall. And in the history exam, there's more 80s and 90s, right? So we can make some comparisons and see some differences in exam scores across these two types of exams using this back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. All right, so now we're going to move on to talking about dot plots. A dot plot is a graph that can be used to give a rough impression of the shape of a data set. It's useful when the data set is not too large and when there are some repeated values. So we don't want to use a dot plot on the last couple of data sets we looked at. And once we actually create one, you, you should see why that's the case, right? Typically, it's data sets like this where they're not too big and we have a lot of repeated values. These are typically good candidates for a dot plot. So let's construct one. We're going to start by just drawing one axis, a horizontal axis, and we're going to number it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those are all the possible data values that show up. We have a 0, 1, 2, 3, a 4, and a 5. So we want to make sure all of our data values are accounted for. So we're going to construct this horizontal axis and label it so that each data value can be placed above one of these marks, right? And now we're going to start this placing. We're going to count up the zeros, one, two, three, four. And we're going to draw four dots above this zero mark here. So one, two, three, four. Now we're going to count up all the ones. We have one, two, three, four, five, six ones. So we're going to draw six dots above the one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now we're going to look at the number of twos, and we're going to count for those. There are five twos, so we draw five dots. And I like to have the dots line up, where all the fourth dots are like the same height, right? Because really we want to kind of see a shape from this. We can continue this process. We have three threes. We have one four and one five. And this is the construction of a dot plot. 
it's not too bad and hopefully it makes sense why this would be a bad idea to do with the last couple of data sets right we had a ton of different data values not many of them were repeated it probably wouldn't have really given us that much information right so this is typically best for smaller data sets where there are a lot of repeated values in this case the number of siblings of 20 students in a math class was a perfect candidate for a dot plot so the last graph we're going to talk about is called a time series plot. And a time series plot is really useful when the data consists of values of a variable measured at different points in time. So it's really useful in determining how a variable changes over time. So here's a good example for this, and this is real data of the end of year price of Facebook stock over the past eight years. Okay, so at the end of 2014, the price of one Facebook stock was $78. That's how we're interpreting this. And this is, again, the real data. I looked this up myself, so I can confirm. Let's go ahead and see if we can graph this and graphically see how this has changed over the years. So we're gonna start with a horizontal and vertical axis, just like so. And our horizontal axis always represents time. So in this case, our unit of time is a year, right? So we're gonna go ahead and label accordingly, and I'm gonna use shorthand. So the 14 represents 2014, the 15 represents 2015, right? So these are years, and that's how we always mark up our horizontal axis. That is always the axis that displays time. Our vertical axis, in this case, is price, right? This is the variable that is changing over time. In this case, that's the price of one Facebook stock so let's go ahead and mark that up accordingly. I'm gonna use jumps of 50. I feel like that is sufficient to display what we're trying to display. And let's see if we can go ahead and label this axis as price and US dollars. And now what we do is we start plotting points, right? So one of these points would be 2014 comma 78, right? The year 2014, the price in dollars 78. So right almost smack dab in between this 50 and 100 mark. Let's go ahead and plot that point. 2015, that's a price of 105, so it's gonna be a little bit above that 100 mark. Let's even go ahead and plot that point. And we're gonna continue plotting these points that we get directly from our table of data. And once we're done plotting these points, what we then do is we connect them with straight lines. So we draw a straight line between these two points straight line between these two points and this sort of gives us a notion of slope right again we're looking at how something is changing over time so we can see that from 2017 to 2018 the price of a stock decreased and that's actually the only time it decreased was from 27 to 2018 every other year it increased from that year to the next other than that right so this is a good way to display data that involves Time. It involves a variable changing over time, and that is with a time series graph. Hopefully this video helped. If you have any questions, leave them below. And until next time, keep flexing those brain muscles. I'll see y'all later.